everyone. In this section on artificial intelligence, we're going to be talking about computational linguistics, natural language processing, and AI management. Uh, for this particular talk, I'm going to focus on using Twitter um, and doing natural language processing in that space. So why would you want to do what's called sometimes called computational linguistics or natural language processing? Well, there's a lot of data out there that's collectible now that's in a language-based format that you really can't analyze uh, via standard kind of regression analysis or something like that. Uh, Twitter data, for instance, or generally social media data, right? Stack Exchange, which is this great repository of questions and answers, public web data um, about different companies and what they're doing and things like that. Facebook data, right? Now there's a lot of restrictions around Facebook data, but if you have like public pages that you can have your customers com comment on, that data is owned uh, by you to some extent. Um, there's some different agreements on that, but you essentially can analyze the text that's there. Reddit is increasing in popularity. Um, Flickr comments and hashtags, right? Um, and of course, you could also think of Instagram, right? Uh, and other photo sharing devices in the space. And in the next session, we're going to talk about how to analyze the actual images. But today, we're going to concentrate on the text that might be there. And even like Wikipedia data, right? So there might be data about different industries and about different aspects, and you want to watch how those things change and evolve over time. And of course, this is just kind of things that are easily publicly available. You could also get into things like looking at um, uh, the uh, stock exchange filings, right, of major companies and using that data to analyze uh, where your company is doing in relationship to its competitors. So we're going to focus um, in this example and in this discussion on Twitter. And why are we going to focus on Twitter? Well, it has a rich data set, right? Um, it's, there's a lot of interesting aspects to it. It's freely available. It does take a little bit of effort to set up. And I'm going to show you some tricks and tips to kind of get through that process easily. Um, it's extremely high volume, so we can easily analyze it. I can, in the session where I'm going to go through the R code, right, we can pull the code down and we can analyze like literally tweets that are being issued right then. It has a very easy to use what's called an API or an applications program interface. This means that you can go out there and you can actually just request from Twitter certain amounts of data. Now, there's a, some restrictions on that. That's part of the cons, right? Uh, but you know, for instance, you can't collect historical data that's too far into the past. Now, there's tools out there where they can allow you to purchase that data or look at it, but uh, it's not easily accessible. Um, another con is that the terms of service are somewhat restrictive. For instance, I can't just give you a bunch of Twitter data, right? Um, I, I can't publish it on a website. I can't do a lot of things with it. I can use it for my own internal analysis and for my own internal examination. Uh, and that's pretty much about it, right? Now, if you have a group of, re of analysts working together, you can share some Twitter uh, data as far as I know. Um, but you know, you can't like republish that data and then make it available to someone else. And there's also a lot of limitations on the API. You can only make so many requests per hour and things like that. But a lot of the tools that we're going to talk about actually take advantage of that for you or deal with that situation automatically. Um, Many tools exist for Twitter data and for analyzing Twitter data. Uh, we're going to use R's uh, TwitR package, uh, which is quite nice. Uh, but other tools that have existed in the past are things like Python has Tweepy, there's Twython, there's TweePy, there's Twitter4j, right? Um, there's something called Tweeter, which I actually built early on in the uh, Twitter years with a great grad student of mine named Derek Monard, which was uh, it gave you the ability to pull down Twitter data in a systematic fashion. Uh, so there's a lot of tools out there. We're going to use Twitter because I try and do all this class in one platform and just do it in R, basically. And the API is publicly accessible, right? It's well documented. If you're a sufficient enough programmer in R or Python or Java or C or any language, you can actually create uh, your own Twitter data collection tool. So... One of the things you need to do in order to use these tools, though, is in order, you need to have a developer ID for Twitter. Um, so the first step of that is that if you don't have a Twitter user account, you need to create one, right? Then once you have your account, you can go to developer.twitter.com and there's an app application process you have to go through to apply for the dev ID. Um, 
I don't have the exact details here because it kind of changes on a regular basis. Uh, but basically, once you fill out this form, you're gonna set and agree to the terms. You're gonna set it off. You send it off, and Twitter's gonna look at it. And they're gonna decide whether or not to authorize a dev ID for you, right? Um, as far as I know, no one I know has ever been denied one. There have been follow up questions at times where they've set back questions. A lot of times, if you tell them you're working on the class project, from what I understand, they're a little more lenient about it. Um, but um, they um, they will sometimes ask questions and it may take three or four days for you to get that dev ID created. So if you're going to use it for the class project here, I would recommend doing this almost immediately after watching this video. Um, eventually, you're going to get access to the developer platform and you should see a set of keys and access tokens tab. Um, and you'll need to copy your consumer API key and consumer API secret. Um, you also need to create an access token and use your access token and access token secret to access uh, Twitter. I'm going to pause here. I'm going to flip over to the actual Twitter dev ID page so I can show you a little bit of this. Um, and then I can show you what it looks like once you have the developer account as well. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to take you through a little bit of the process of how to apply for a developer account. So um, if I want to apply for an account, I first have to log in and I'm not going to use my normal Twitter handle. I'm going to use one that I manage for a journal, uh, but um, I hit the apply button once I'm logged in. And if you haven't logged in, it'll say, you know, log in um, and I'll go to apply for an academic account and wants to know the reason why. Um, and, you know, I, ideally for this, if I was really doing it for this academic journal, I'd probably be like building a customized solution house. But right now I'm just going to click the teaching button because that's what I'm doing right now. Um, you could probably click students, right? And then it makes sure that you have some information. If you don't have a, um, a phone number entered, you'll have to enter that. And there's some other details along those lines. But eventually you can hit click next. And now I have to say like what, who is the organization and I can say like, um, I, um, you know, let's just, I'll full, I'm not going to complete this application, but I'll just do bull college, right? NC state university, right? I, um, at, let's see, at the organization name was probably at pool. Um, I don't know for sure. Right. Um, you could go pool.ncsu.edu. Uh, primary country of organization is going to be United States. How do you characterize organ academic? Um, and then uh, academic, right? So we'll just say we're academic. Um, we don't have, I mean, we say we have customers, right? And those customers are also located in the United States. Oh, oh it has to be specific North America. Okay. So then we hit next. And then this is the part where I'm going to kind of stop because this is the part where it gets a little detailed, but you essentially have to write why you want to use it and see it says for students and teachers, please include the name of the school, name and structure in the course number. So you put my information down there if you want to do that. Um, please describe how you analyze. For us, it's primarily going to be like sentiment analysis for a class project, but you can put down whatever you want. We are at use tweet, retweet, like, follow, direct. probably not, right? Because we're just going to collect the data. Uh, do you plan to display tweets or aggregate data about Twitter content? And the answer is yes, right? You're going to be looking at the content, but you're not going to republish it or present it anywhere else besides inside this class. So make sure you note that. Uh, will your product service make Twitter content or drive information available to a government entity? Um, and as it says, you know, universities do not fall under this category. What they're specifically talking about is if you were going to use it uh, for a public policy type process at like a regional government or something like that, right? So I'm going to stop there. I'm now going to flip over again and show you what the account looks like once you've once you've got it. Um, so as you can see, you need to review, agree to some terms, and, and then you'd have um, your account be monitored. Okay, so here's what it looks like once you actually have an account, and this is my actual account, so it has all the, the information up there. Um, uh, I'm gonna click on one of these, I'm not gonna click on all of them because I use some of these still, uh, but I have. you can apply for different apps for different purposes, right? And each of them will actually present you with uh, the uh, its own app ID and its own authentication scheme, so you can have multiple apps uh, with the same developer. Uh, but the most important part is if you click on the details, um, and this is a, the first one I think I ever created, right? Um, and you go over to keys and tokens, 
these are the numbers you're going to need that we talked about the access keys right um, and yes i'm showing you my consumer api keys right now but as soon as i save this video i'm going to regenerate them so they won't be useful so don't bother trying to keep them down i'm not going to show you the access tokens right but all these data is what you're going to need to actually run with the r script and I'm going to do a separate whole video about how to actually pull the data with R once you have this, but I'm going to flip over quickly to just show you where to paste these numbers in. Okay, so here we are back in uh, our studio, and you'll see that there is this Twitter setup where you're going to paste in those API keys and secrets, and I made this code available to you on the Moodle, and then the access token and the access secret, right? Um, so that's where you would put in those uh, strings that you would get from the Twitter API. And once you have that and you have this all set up, you can now go ahead and collect your own Twitter data. So I'm going to stop there. I'm going to switch over to another topic and uh, we'll come back to this when we start to go through the practical hands-on examples. Okay, so before we move off of this topic, I just want to quickly mention that I'm going to be presenting to you in the hands-on example uh, natural language processing in R based upon this great post by Jeffrey Breen, who does a lot of uh, natural language work. Um, and essentially, we're going to search for Twitter mentions, uh, search for mentions of a brand on Twitter. We're going to score the sentiment of the tweets, and then we're going to summarize that brand. And that's all available in this URL, which I'll make available on the Moodle as well. Um, the um, And then, you know, this is kind of a standard approach to sentiment analysis which basically has you getting some text, tokenizing it, which means breaking into words or features, lower casing all the tokens so they're all roughly the same, right? Um, and then removing what are called stop words. These are words that just um, are used all the time and don't really have a lot of meaning. Um, so these, for English, these would be words like the, a, and, but, you know, things like that, which don't really affect a lot of what's going on in the sentence. Uh, and then we're going to compute the sentiment of each individual word, um, or sometimes it's done as a whole where you do something where you take different words together. But in the process we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about what's called a dictionary based sentiment analysis technique. Um, and that just looks at each token, says what's the sentiment of that token, and then sums it up across all of it. So in the applied section today, I'll um, talk a little bit about how to actually do that.